the course on uh, finite and algorithmic model theory, part two. I say automata-based methods. I have, uh, though I'll start with a little wrap-up of uh, uh, what we did yesterday. So I said in finite model theory, we're aiming to develop tools for studying the expressive power of logic in finite structures. And I noted that the relation of elementary equivalence, which is sort of the fundamental relation in classical model theory that one studies, is in a sense trivial, I mean, uh, not in the computational sense, um, it, on finite structures in the sense that it coincides with isomorphism, so it doesn't tell us anything about definability as such. Uh, and as a consequence, every property of finite structures is definable by a first order theory. So to study definability in the finite, we stratify this relation of elementary equivalence. And we, I looked at two stratifications, one by quantifier rank and the other by the number of variables. And each of these has a nice characterization in terms of spoiler duplicator games, uh, which, I mean, it's just a, in some ways a reformulation of the, of the equivalence, but it gives us a nice perspicuous way of describing it and uh, using these equivalences. And we use these games to show that some properties are not definable by first order sentences, connectivity to colorability, and some are not even axiomatizable by a finite number of variables. So, you know, uh, infinite set of sentences, but using a finite number of variables, we still can't do uh, evenness, existence of a perfect matching in a graph, Hamiltonicity, right? These were examples that came up. And then I concluded with the Hanf locality theorem, which shows that structures that look locally the same are not distinguished by first order formulas. So I want to get back to this. And I've uh, given the cleaned up formulation, which I kind of referred to while I, having that messy formulation up on the, on the board. So I'll, I, I, I'll, I'll state it a little bit more cleanly now. Say A and B are Hanf equivalent with radius r. If there's a bijection between the elements of A and the elements of B, which takes a point A to a point in B, so that the neighborhood in A of this point is isomorphic to the neighborhood of uh, uh, its image in B, right? The neighborhood of radius R. And the theorem is that there is a radius. Once you fix the vocabulary and you fix the uh, quantifier rank, there is a radius so that if two structures are Hanf equivalent with that radius, then they are indistinguishable by any first order formula with quantifier rank P. And uh, we can use this to revisit some of the proofs of inexpressibility we did. And they, they kind of become very easy to see. You, know, you can just give a picture, in a sense, and show it. So my example of connectivity and two colorability, remember two cycles and one cycle, they weren't Hanf equivalent simply because they had different sizes. Because I was using the same example for evenness, so I had 2 times 2 to the p on one side, 2 to the p plus 1 on the other, so there's no bijection. So in the way I've defined Hanf equivalence, they were not. Uh, but for leave out the evenness for connectivity and two colorability, I can choose a cycle and two cycles so that these two add up to the same length, but make it big enough so that when you look at the neighborhood of any point, it just looks like a simple line. And so, you know, any bijection between them will actually, you know, map neighborhoods to isomorphic neighborhoods. Okay. So, immediately from this illustration, you see in the Hanf theorem, you get that connectivity and two colorability are not definable. Acyclicity is not definable. Just take that graph versus this graph, choose the sizes so that they match up. And again, you have a bijection between them so that the neighborhoods match up. You just need to make sure that things close to the endpoints are mapped close to the endpoints by this bijection, and things in the middle get mapped to this over here so that the neighborhood, neighborhoods look the same. Okay. Here's an illustration showing that planarity is not definable by first order logic. So what I've done is take a five clique and imagine you replace every edge by a long path. 
And here, I've taken the same graph, but instead of these two long parts, I have these two long parts. This is a planar graph. This is, you know, because it's a subdivision of a five clique. It's not a planar graph, but there is, I mean, the neighborhood of any element locally looks exactly the same in the two graphs. Okay? To me, this has something of this uh, uh, flavor of the Escher drawing that uh, Samson was showing us yesterday. You know, locally, this thing is very planar. It's indistinguishable from that. It's when you put it all together, you know, and, and you go around the loop that it kind of uh, falls apart. OK. So that's Hans locality theorem. Another locality theorem very commonly used, and uh, in tomorrow's lecture we'll be looking at some uses of this, is Geifman's theorem, which is in some sense stronger in that you can derive uh, the Hanf version from it. So the key thing is in, in Hanf's theorem, you're looking at neighborhoods of points, and you're looking at the isomorphism types of those neighborhoods. Geifman's theorem is, in, in, in a sense, has, um, instead of looking at the isomorphism types, it's enough to look at what happens, what first order formulas are true in the neighborhood, but you have to, you know, it's, it's not quite then just matching up neighborhoods by a bijection. So let me just state the theorem. It's, um, in first order logic, you can say, you can write down a formula with two free variables, x and y, which says that the distance between points x and y is, say, greater than d. And I write delta x, y is greater than d as shorthand for that formula. OK? It's uh, easy to write. We sort of did something. Uh, we did something similar with, when we defined connectivity. So another piece of notation. So say I have a formula with a free variable x. I write psi n, where if n is some definable set, you re relativize all the quantifiers in psi by that set. So you replace there exists x by there exists x inside the set n, such that, and uh, so on. So basically, it says that whatever psi asserts holds true within the set n. And we're going to, what we're going to do is relativize formulas to the neighborhood around a point. And so we say a basic local sentence is one of this fo the following form. It exerts, asserts the existence of s points, which were pair, pairwise far apart. Right? I've written 2r here. So basically, you're saying that the r neighborhoods of these points are disjoint. And says that each one of them satisfies the, the neighborhood, the r neighborhood around each one satisfies the formula psi. Okay. So a basic local sentence is just an assertion that there exists some set of points which are with disjoint neighborhoods, and something is true in all of these neighborhoods. And Geifman's theorem basically says that's pretty much what you can do. In first order logic, any first order sentence is equivalent to a Boolean combination of basic local sentences. Okay? So this is the sort of strong locality prin principle of first order logic. I'm not going to give you a proof of this. This is rather. Uh, uh, Convoluted argument, yeah. Doesn't psi also have to be indexed by i? In other words, psi yeah. is. Uh, no, it's it's one formula, psi. So okay. you're claiming there's a bunch of points that have exactly the same yeah. neighborhood. Uh, well, not exactly. Yeah, the, the, and we're asserting one first order formula that holds in all these neighborhoods. Oh. Okay. Right. But ultimately, it's a Boolean combination of these. So, so, so you, oh, you, you, you can. Sorry, I, I, that's what I missed. Right. So. Um, That's right. Okay, so. Um, this is true on all structures. And this is true on all structures. This is, not, there's, this is nothing to do with the finiteness. Okay, I'll come back to. Uh, I mean, in, the, in in some sense, this is the point at which I uh, intended to get to at the at the end of the first lecture, the discussion of locality, and I'll come back to uh, uh, uses of this in uh, the in the next lecture. Right now, I want to say a few things that kind of follow from this characterizations um, of these stratified elementary equivalences we've been looking at. Say you have a pair of structures. The disjoint sum of the structures 
right, or disjoint union is simply the structure you get by taking the disjoint union of the universes and let interpret each relation as the union of the two relations. So they're really just, you know, two structures unconnected in any way with each other, uh, uh, for, formed into one structure. Now we can say, if you have a pair of structures which are p-equivalent, a1 and a2, and similarly b1 and b2 are p-equivalent, then the disjoint union of a1 and b1 is p-equivalent to the disjoint union of a2 and b2. In other words, this p-equivalence is a congruence with respect to this disjoint sum operation. And the argument is obvious when you think of it as a game. You have a structure where you have this a1 and b1, and you have the disjoint sum, and they're not, there's no relations that connect them. And on the other side, you have a2 and b2. And we know that duplicator has a winning strategy restricted to these two structures and a winning strategy restricted to these two structures. So you combine the winning strategies simply by saying, whenever spoiler plays in an element of A1, respond according to the winning strategy between A1 and A2. Whenever spoiler plays on one of these, you respond according to the winning strategy restricted to those two. And it's easy to see that this combined strategy defines a winning strategy for duplicator on these. Okay. And the same argument holds for uh, the k-equivalence relation. Uh, so superscript k, meaning if you count the number of variables, again, if there's a winning strategy on the unbounded game in k variables, between a1 and a2, and similarly between b1 and b2, there's a winning strategy on the combined structure by just composing the two. Well, you see my show. Then how many variables do you need? I mean, just it's for, for it's k. Uh, oh, because if you move it to the other structure, you move it to, OK. Yeah, the point is there's fewer than k on any one, and we know duplicator has a winning strategy. OK. Uh, OK. So that's disjoint sum, but there's other ways we can combine structures. Suppose, for instance, we had a pair of structures who, where the vocabulary includes a binary relation which is interpreted as a linear order of the structure. So these are ordered structures. Okay? And I define the ordered sum of A and B as the structure which is the disjoint union of the, the, the universes again. For all relations other than the order, you again take the disjoint union of the, the relations. For the order, you, you, you take the union, but you also say that every element of A comes before every element of B. Right? So you now again have a linearly ordered structure. Okay? And exactly the same argument works. Right? That the, if duplicator has a winning strategy on A1 and A2 and B1 and B2, duplicator has a winning strategy on the combined one because the only thing that links these two is the order, and the strategy always plays if, uh, if one element is less than over here, less than another one over here, that property is preserved. So the combined strategy is still a winning strategy on the ordered sum. So this relation is a congruence also with respect to ordered sums. OK, and again, this holds for uh, OK. Slightly, slight variation on the sum. Suppose we have two structures. And their universes intersect in a set X. OK? I define the sum over X to be the structure whose universe is the union of A and B. So now, this is not the disjoint union. There is a set X, which is common. And all relations are the union over A and B, the, the, the union of the common relations. So think of it this way, as a picture It's more like we have a structure A, and we have a structure B, and we're keeping the points x in common. And now, any tuple which is in a relation, of course, all the elements are either in A or all of them in B. Those, you know, some may, some of those elements may be in both A and B. Right? That's the structure which I call the sum of A and B over x. Now, what can we say about this? say, combining strategies, if you have a1 and a2 and b1 and b2, and you take the sum over x, it's not so obvious. Uh, actually, we can. I'm, 
I mean, for the p equivalence, um, let me just say, right. So what we say is the following. If there's a winning strategy between A1 and A2, which uh, on the subset X in A1 and the subset Y on A2 always, you know, as a word, you, you always match elements of X with elements of Y. What, what, maybe I should say this a bit more clearly. We have a structure A. We expand it with new constants and name a, every element of X by a constant symbol. So this means that this, in this P equivalence, in any winning strategy, every element of X will have to map to a corresponding element of Y always. Right? That, the map on X and Y is fixed because you've named them by constants. But what is, what is, what is Y? And... Okay. I'm just writing, this is an expansion of A by, by a set of constants. Now, A1 is a structure with a set X. A2 is another structure with a set Y of constants. Okay. Right. And say these are P equivalent, and these are P equivalent, B1 and B2. You take the sum of A1 and B1 over X, and the sum of A2 and B2 over Y, these are also P equivalent. Right? In other words, because, let me. So, so do X and Y need to have the same cardinality? Yes, yeah, yes, yes. I mean, I, I haven't, <laughs> that's right. So the point is, we have A1, sorry, A1, B1, and we have A2, B2, and this set Y. Right? And we, we want to conclude that conclusion that these two are p-equivalent. It's not enough to assume that A1 is p-equivalent to A2 and B1 is p-equivalent to B2. You have to assume that the strategy between A1 and A2 respects X and Y in some sense to be able to, to form the composition of the strategies. That's what this assumption is saying, that you name all the elements of X and all the elements of Y. And if you have a strategy which respects that, then you can combine these two strategies to get a strategy on the combined structure. Isn't that too strong an assumption? I mean, is it necessary to, to kind of? Well, no. Uh, okay. Is it necessary? I mean. Uh, well, sorry, I, I understand that that's a loaded question. Yes, I mean, I, I, you know, surely you can come up with an example. I mean, can you formulate a weaker condition? Yes, can, sorry. Can you, say, you can certainly make weaker assumptions. Yes. You, you put assumptions on the strategies. That's right. You put assumptions on the structures themselves. Right. There, it's not so clear how to weaken it. And now, the strategies, you just want to say that whatever they do in X, mm -hmm. spoiler does anything in X and Y, duplicator will respond at Y or X. Exactly. And will respond the same way whether he's using this, the, A the, the A strategy or the B strategy. strategy. Exactly. That seems to be what's really needed. That's right. But that's a condition on the strategies, not on the structures. OK. So. Um, so I'm going to come back again to, to, to using this in a moment. I'm, I'm, I'm sort of building up the machinery. I want to say a little bit about second order logic, because this seems a good point. So we've talked about first order logic so far. Second order logic is the extension with quantifiers over relations. So we can now say there exists an x, where x is a relation symbol right, of arity m. And this is true. And, and of course, then we can use it inside phi as a relation symbol. And this is true in a structure if the, there, A can be expanded by an MRE relation interpreting this to make phi true. OK? And I write sigma 1, 1 for the existential fragment of second order logic. That is, those formulas of second order logic, written, which written in prenex normal form, have existential quantifiers in the front, followed by phi A first order formula. Monadic second order logic is those formulas of second order logic in which all the uh, relational quantifiers are over unary relations, so they're over sets rather than uh, arbitrary relations. And again, we can put it in any MSO formula in prenex normal form with second order quantifiers preceding first order ones. And I'll write monadic sigma 1, 1 for those formulas which in prenex normal form have only existential quantifiers, and monadic pi 1, 1 for those formulas which in prenex normal form have only 
universal quantifiers. Okay. Now, what do I want to say about this? This is an example I showed you before, three colorability, which is not definable in first order logic. I didn't prove that to you, but given the tools we have developed, you can easily do this. And I showed you that it's definable by a monadic sigma 1 1 formula. Connectivity, right? I showed you is not first order definable. It's easily definable by a monadic pi 1 1 formula. So this says that a graph is connected because it says that for every set of vertices you take, if it's non empty and it's closed under the edge relation, then it contains everything. Okay? So that's just saying that the graph is connected. Um, it's not, connectivity is not definable by a monadic sigma 1 1 sentence. This was a result already in uh, Fagan's PhD thesis in 1974. And you can prove it by an application of Hanf's locality theorem, even though Hanf's locality theorem was about first order logic. Because what it is is you take a cycle of length 2n and the disjoint union of two cycles of length n. And we know these are Hanf equivalent if n is big enough with respect to the radius. But you can show something more. You can show that take any coloring of this, any color the cycle C2n in any way, if n is big enough, then you can find a coloring of this, which is p equivalent. Right? So that the, the, the neighborhoods with, the, with respect to radius p look the same. Okay? It's just n has to be enormously big for, for this to work for any coloring. Okay? That's, uh, so this means that if you could define connectivity by an existential monadic sigma 1 1 sentence, that sentence would be true. You take the interpretation of the existential quantifiers, which makes it true. Take that as your coloring. Repeat the coloring over here. And you know that you have the two things are first order equivalent up to quantifier rank p. And that's a contradiction, because the second graph is disconnected. OK. So you can't do this with monadic sigma 1 1 sentence. So can you give some justification for this <coughs> coloring fact? I mean... Why you can find this coloring? I mean, it's just a, a, a sort of, in some sense, a pigeonhole argument. If n is big enough, then you have repeated patterns of uh, you know, length p. There are only finitely many. You'll find lots of repeated patterns. Some pattern will occur frequently enough that you get two points with the same pattern around them, which are exactly distance n apart, if, you, know, if, you, if you make n big enough. And then you just uh, essentially think of splitting the n cycle I mean, if you have, if you have a big n cycle, right, colored in such a way, and you find two points over here, so which are exactly distance n apart, and their neighborhoods look the same, you essentially think of this as coloring two n cycles with exactly the same colors, and the neighborhoods look exactly the same. Yeah. It's a side condition that's hard to realize and not necessary for the argument. It's, um, so, but, but, but this is, a, I, mean, I mean, this was, a, this was, this was Fagan's original argument. The revised version by Aita and Fagan allowed you to choose the, the, the length of these two cycles dependent on the coloring. But that requires another argument for why that, that's valid. And, uh, and I, I wanted to avoid that here. Yes. Well, I'm not sure I understand this example because you can always guess a subset and say that it is closed under uh, relations, like um, under neighborhood, and uh, it's complement two, and that separates these two. Sorry. There, no, no. So, so, so we, so we, we, we I, th I think what you're saying is. Disconnected. Is yeah, so disconnectedness is monadic sigma 1 1. That's what this says. But connectedness is not. Well, well, you're, you're essentially describing this formula, right? Of course. Okay. Right, so, so this is an application of Hans locality theorem to get an inexpressibility result for, uh, for monadic second order logic, or the, the existential fragment. We can also extend the game uh, we, we, we defined. Uh, oh. To monadic second order logic, 
right? The, I, I'm saying O because I realize I say M there, but I've been using P all along, and there might be an inconsistency later. But anyway, we have a, a, a spoiler duplicator game between two, uh, played on two structures A and B. And at each stage now, spoiler can either make a point move or a set move, right? In a point move, spoiler chooses an element as before, and duplicator has to re respond with an element of the other structure. In a set move, spoiler chooses a subset, a set, say S1 on one side, and duplicator has to respond with a set in the other structure, right? This, co this corresponds to the quantification of a sets. And if, after M rounds, you look at the structures expanded with the relations, with the sets that have been chosen, and this, the map defined by the elements that have been chosen is a partial isomorphism, then duplicator has won the game. Right? So duplicator has to preserve the, not just partial isomorphism on the original structures, but expanded with the sets that were chosen during the game. Okay? It's uh, exactly analogous to, to, to what we had before. We define quantifier rank exactly by adding the additional rule that we count uh, set quantifiers just as we counted uh, uh, ordinary quantifiers. And we have the equivalence between this game and equivalence in MSO up to quantifier rank P. OK, I'm not going to sort of argue this much further. This is mainly, let me introduce a bit of notation. For structure A, I'll write type MSO A for the set of all sentences with quantifier rank less than P that satisfy. Again, up to logical equivalence, there are finitely many such sentences once you've restricted the quantifier rank and uh, you're in a finite vocabulary. And we write two things are MSOP equivalent if, they, if their types are the same, in other words, they satisfy the same sentences. Okay. So, um, Yes, I just said this. So the, this relation has finite index. And moreover, we can find a single sentence that characterizes this type, as, as we had before. So having defined the game, so just as I showed you that this P equivalence is a congruence, the same thing sort of follows for this MSO game, right? Because now the, the, the only th thing to consider th is the set move. So if spoiler chooses a subset of uh, disjoint union of A1 and B1, do, that decomposes into a subset of A1 and a subset of B1. You look at the response in the two se separate strategies, and you take their union. Okay? And this works for ordered sums, and also sums over a set X. Again, in the sense of you know, having the expansion with the, with the constants. And here I want to stress, I mean, I could also define, I defined the game for MSO. I could, you could also define a game for second order logic where spoiler gets to choose an arbitrary relation and duplicator has to respond with a relation in the other structure. But then, then this really doesn't work. For the simple reason that a spoiler move played on a structure like this picks a relation of these, and a relation over the disjoint union of A and B doesn't decompose into a relation on A and a relation on B, because there, it, it relates elements of A with elements of B. OK, so this, this kind of thing doesn't work if you go beyond monadic second order logic. Right? What makes it work is that these sets decompose into their individual parts. Moreover, you can show that here plus is any one of these sums. You can actually compute, given the types of the two of A and B, you can get the type of the sum structure. And th th I'm not going to uh, tell you wh why. Uh, it'll, it'll take me too far. But uh, and I mean, I don't need the computability uh, for the moment, but this is just an observation. OK. So now, I'm going to talk a little bit about strings. What do I mean by strings? I'm, by strings, I mean structures which have one binary relation, which is a linear order of the universe, and some collection of unary relations. So a structure like this is a linearly ordered structure, and you have unary relations. So I can think of this as a word over an alphabet. Well, the alphabet is the power set of u, right? So for each element, you take the set of elements of u which are true of it, right? So if I have n unary relations, this corresponds to a string in an, in an, alf, in an alphabet with two n letters. Two, sorry, two to the n letters. 
And okay, I, I call I've written Buchi Elgot Trachtenberg. The the the, the Buchi Elgot Trachtenberg theorem is much more than this, right? But I'm I'm just taking one bit of it. So if you have a sentence of MSO, this says that the language consisting of those strings, which satisfy phi, and by that I mean in this sense, right? You you, you take structures with a linear order over a fixed alphabet, then this language is regular. I say it's much stronger because, of course, there's a converse as well. I think I see, uh, right, I, okay, I don't say it. There's a converse, right? Any regular language, can, you know, you can translate. Uh, yeah, for any regular language, you can define an MSO sentence. That's in some sense, you, you can do a direct translation from a finite automaton, right? Um, and of, of, of course, the theorem also extends to infinite strings, uh, uh, et cetera. But I just want to look at this, this direction for finite strings. And you get a particularly perspicuous proof using the myhill neroad theorem, right? H, I don't know. Well, my, I, I, the myhill neroad theorem is something I did as an undergraduate in an auto, automata theory course. So it's something I, I find very familiar. If you, um, oh, if you don't know it, the mild neuro theorem says you have an arbitrary equivalence relation on strings. We call it, say, right invariant. If whenever two strings are equivalent, appending the same string to them gives you equivalent strings, right? The equivalence uh, relation is right invariant. And the mild neuro theorem says a language is regular if and only if it is the union of equivalence classes of some right invariant equivalence relation of finite index. Okay. And this is kind of immediate from the translation into finite automata. And now, all I need to note is, if you have a formula of MSO, and it has quantifier rank P, then the language it defines is invariant under this equivalence relation, necessarily. This relation has finite index. We've argued that because it's, you know, there are only finitely many different formulas. And it is right invariant by the fact that this relation is a congruence for ordered sum. Okay. And so any language you can define is necessarily regular. Right? Um, and here's an interesting use of this. I'll show you that there is no formula of MSO, no sentence of MSO in the language of graph that defines the collection of Hamiltonian graphs. Okay, so now this is nothing about strings, this is just an ordinary question about definability of MSO on graphs. Suppose we had such a formula, right, which defined Hamiltonian graphs. Well, now I define a formula phi prime by just replacing every occurrence of the edge relation inside phi <laughs> by the following relation in a vocabulary with two unary relations A and B. It just says AX and BY or BX and AY. Okay? So I, repl I replace in phi this by this formula. What do I get? I get a formula phi prime, which if you interpret it on a string, it says that the graph you get in the complete, uh, sorry, that the graph, the complete bipartite graph you get by putting all A's on one side, all B's on the other side, and putting all edges between them is Hamiltonian, right? That's what the formula phi prime says. But a complete bipartite graph is Hamiltonian if and only if the two sides have the same number of vertices, right? To construct a Hamiltonian graph in a bipartite, in a com to construct a Hamiltonian cycle in a complete bipartite graph, you have to start at one end and cross over. Each edge has to take you to the other side. To complete the cycle, you have to cross exactly the same number of times. So this is not a Hamiltonian cycle. Therefore, this formula phi prime is true in a string if and only if it has an equal number of A's and B's. But this is not a regular language, and therefore this is impossible. Okay? So, um, I mean, I, I like this example because, you know, in terms of building up tools for proving inexpressivity, right, we have our Aaron Feucht games, we have, we build the locality theorems, and this basically says the pumping lemma is also a useful tool for proving inexpressibility of, uh, 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 in logic. You know, they 
is a proof in Compton's thesis of this using zero one loss. Right. Okay. Uh, well, as I, I, I said in, in, in Albert's talk, we'll get to uh, zero one dollars as well. Sorry, uh, is this statement over ordered structures? Or just no. Well, the the point is, it you you can make it. I mean, so the statement over ordered order structures is stronger, and it's still true. Okay, uh, but all, all I'm saying is, suppose there's a formula which defines Hamiltonian cycles, even without an order. I mean, assuming, okay. If there is one which defines it with an order, this still works. Replace e x y by this. It's you now have a, 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 an MSO la sentence in an ordered language, which still defines the set of strings with an equal number of a's and b's. So you get a contradiction, right? Doing it without an order is a weaker statement, but it's still true, right? Okay. Um, So now, that was strings. Now I'm going to talk a little bit about automata over trees. Uh, because the, the, the connection between MSO and, uh, and finite automata extends in this. And uh, as I said, there's a, there, I mean, I'm, I mentioned briefly on the slide, there's a, there's a rich theory that goes in this direction of which I'm, I'm only illustrating methods with illustrative results, which is what uh, I said I was doing in this course. So for us, a rooted directed tree is a directed graph. So you have one binary relation well, with a distinguished root. So you have a constant A. And for every vertex V, there is a path from, there's a unique directed path from A to V. OK? Uh, that's right. We might consider th things expanded with uh, additional unary relations. So we get colored uh, rooted directed trees and so on. Now I'm going to define certain operations on these rooted directed trees. Given TA, I define RTA to be the directed tree, which is essentially you take the original A and you add a new root to it, and you make that uh, uh, the root of your directed tree. Okay. I make the observation that the type in MSO up to quantifier rank P of this thing is determined entirely by the type over, over here. Well, do I? OK. Well, let, let, let me carry on. Now, you get. Any rooted directed tree, by starting with some single node trees, right, and repeated applications of the operation of adding a root and taking the sum over the root, right? So this is the sum of two structures where we identify the roots. Okay, this disjoint sum while identifying the roots, and you can build up any tree by a sequence of these operations. So from an MSO formula. We can translate it into a bottom-up tree automaton, essentially working on this, if you will, the parse tree of our rooted directed tree using these operations, which computes the type of the whole tree. Right? In other words, the, the states are the equivalence classes, MSOP, where P, I knew I would get a, my M's and P's mixed up at some point, but P is the quantifier rank of phi. And there are transitions in the automaton corresponding the, to the two operations, right, of rooted sum, of, of, disjoint, of sum over A and adding a root. And so this is a tree automaton. So, you know, it, 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 it involves, a, uh, you know, this binary operation. And the accepting states are exactly those classes that satisfy phi. In other words, those types that include phi. OK. What does this do? This allows us to translate any formula of MSO into an automaton, just like you know, we had on strings. And we're going to extend this uh, one step further. Okay. So, and I'm going to look at uh, graphs now, undirected graphs in general, of bounded tree width. Now, I, 
I know many of you, many of you are familiar with tree width, but I assume not everybody is. So the tree width of an undirected graph is a measure of how tree-like the structure is. Right? In, in some sense, associate with every graph, there is a measure called its tree width. It's the more interconnected the graph, the more unlike a tree, essentially, the higher the tree width. Trees have small tree width. They have, trees have tree width one. Okay. Uh, and I'll, I'll show you examples of graphs of higher tree width at the moment. But the intuition is, before I give you a formal definition, a graph has tree width k if it can be covered by subgraphs of at most k plus 1 nodes in a tree-like fashion. So here, the black nodes and lines represent a graph. The blue blobs are subsets which cover the whole graph. The blue blobs are connected in a tree-like fashion. I can make this precise. And the largest blob has four nodes in it. So this shows that the that black graph there has tree width 3. Right because it can be covered by subsets of si subgraphs of size 4 in this tree-like way. OK. And this covering is what we call a tree decomposition of a graph. Formally speaking, we have a graph. A tree, tree decomposition associates to that graph a tree t. OK. And we have a relation which basically assigns to every element of t a set of vertices. OK, so I just call that a, I mean, it's just a relation between the vertices of the graph and the nodes of the tree, which satisfies certain conditions. For each v, this set, I should say, is non-empty, right? Every vertex in the graph is associated with non some non-empty set of nodes in the tree. And that set of nodes is a connected subtree of t. So you can't have the same vertex appearing in two nodes in, in the tree without appearing everywhere on the, on the path in between, right? And every edge in the graph is covered by some node. There is a node in the tree such that both u and v are associated to it, right? There's a node t. Okay, I said this is a sort of maybe if you're seeing this for the first time, a uh, difficult definition to get your head around. Keep the picture I had on the previous slide in, in, in mind. That's, what, that, that, that's really what this is doing. And then the tree width is the smallest number such that we can find a tree decomposition for the graph, where the set of nodes, set of vertices of the graph associated with any node of the tree has size at most k plus 1. OK? So trees, I said, have tree width 1. Why is this? Well, actually, so if you have a tree and you want to cover it with, uh, give a tree decomposition, what are going to be the nodes of your tree decomposition? Each node has to, every, every edge has to appear inside a node of the tree decomposition. But that's pretty much all you really need to do. So the nodes of the tree decomposition really correspond to the edges. And you can see, so the, this one appears in these four, okay, but they're connected. Okay, well, I, I, I haven't exactly told you what the, and uh, the one sorry? And the one above, sorry, yes, in the five. And, uh, it, uh, uh, and, and these form a connected part of the red tree. Okay, so um, this is why trees have tree width one, and this is why we have that k plus one in the definition. Right? Why you why you count the num maximum number of nodes minus one because trees really should have tree width one rather than two. If you have a cycle in a graph, oh, sorry, your graph is a cycle, I should say. So it has tree width two because you can cover it with sets of size three. There's various ways you could do this. Here's one. I'll start with that set of size 3. Now note, because this vertex, in some sense, both its edges are covered, I can forget about it. I don't need it anymore. So as my next one, I'll take that. OK? 
Now this vertex has had both of its edges covered. I don't need it anymore. So for my third one, I'll take that set, size three. Then this one, then this one, and then that one. And my tree is really, therefore, something which looks like a simple line. It's a path. OK? A clique you can't cover except by taking all the elements into a single set. And so a k-clique has tree with k minus 1. And a grid, by, by grid I just mean m by n, OK? The tree width is the minimum of the two, dimen two dimensions. Okay. You do something similar to what you did with the cycle. Your bags consist of, let's say, uh, here, let, let, let's say the, this is the smaller dimension. You take this and one of those, and then you can drop this and take the rest of these and the next one, etc. taking sets of size m plus 1 at a time. You can cover the whole thing. Okay. Of course, I'm claiming here not just that you have decompositions this width, but those are optimal. You can't do better than that. And that, of course, requires rather uh, more proof. But that's true in each of these cases. So why, I mean, tree width is something that uh, has been widely studied in the, well, first in graph structure theory, and then in the algorithmic world, because it sort of turns out to be a very useful way of parametrizing algorithms. And basically, the, the, the essence of this is that graphs of small tree width admit efficient dynamic programming algorithms for problems which are otherwise intractable. Given a graph with a tree decomposition, you can essentially work your algorithm bottom up along this tree decomposition and combine results. And at any point, you, uh, at, at, as, you, as you come up bottom up, you only have a small intersection with the, with the results you've computed be, before. And in that, as I said, by, by essentially a dynamic programming approach, you can capture all the information you need to sort of recursively work on the graph. Right? It's, you have algorithms that work re recursively on the tree structure. And these small sets, because they bound the size of the intersection of your trees, basically limit the amount of information you need to collect from the recursive calls as you go up. So that, that's at any stage, a small set of vertices from the interface to the rest of the graph. That, the, that's the, the essence of, the, of, of what a tree decomposition does. So trying to formalize this, we can say, you look at the de decomposition bo bottom up. What you have is a graph of tree width k. When, once you have the decomposition, is obtained from graphs with at most k plus 1 nodes through a finite sequence of application of the operation of taking sums over sets of at most k elements. What do I mean by sums over sets? I mean exactly the thing we had before. Right? The operation of taking a sum where the intersection of the two graphs has at most k elements, okay? and you identify these. So this is uh, the, the sum of g1 and g2 over a set x. So in this tree decomposition, going bottom up, you'd start with these two sets and take the sum over their intersection, which is this. You now have a, a, a set with three elements, right? a graph with three elements. And you take its sum with this one, identifying this, just this one element. right? You have this graph with four. You take its sum with this one, identifying this. Take its sum with this one, identifying that. Sum with this one, identifying that, et cetera. Okay? At, at each point, you're identifying one element. And this generalizes to arbitrary k. That's what a tree decomposition gives you. Okay? So if tk is the class of graphs with tree width at most k, I mean, when I introduced this operation of disjoint sum over a set, I said we, we, we have constants for these elements. So let's make this explicit. Start with graphs which have, let's say, expanded with k plus 1 constant, c0 up to ck. And we allow the operation, which we had before, of the sum over the set C of G and H, right? I'm also going to define another operation, just purely slightly syntactic, 
which takes a graph G, which has these additional constants, and erases the name CI. You can forget some. OK? Then the tree decomposition can be seen. For any, for any graph of tree with K, you, you can get it by starting with graphs with at most k plus 1 vertices, and a sequence of these two operations. You, the erasure operation is basically you forget the names of vertices so that when you take the disjoint sum, you're not going to use them. And this sum takes the two graphs G and H while identifying the ones named by constants. Okay? So a sequence of these operations gives you any graph of tree width at most k. And now, what does this all, all of this have to do with MSL? Well, the point is, the erasure operation, it's very easy to see, is also this p equivalence is a congruence with respect to this. For the simple reason, all you're doing is forgetting information. right? So if two graphs are MSOP equivalent, so here row 1 is then interpretation of a constant, the map from the constants to k, at most k plus 1 vertices. Then so is this. The disjoint sum over a set C we've already seen is a uh, this MSO equivalence, P equivalence, is a congruence for that. And therefore, we can, given a graph and a tree decomposition of it, given an MSO formula of quantifier rank P, we can turn the formula into an automaton which works, up, works on the bottom-up decomposition of the graph. Again, the states of the automata are the equivalence classes of this equivalence relation, and we can compute the type of the tree. This is the essence of Coursell's theorem, which basically says, given any MSO sentence and fix k, there is a linear time algorithm, linear in the size of the graph, which for any graph of tree width at most k decides whether the graph satisfies phi. So we can translate phi into a linear time algorithm. Basically, the idea is you translate the formula into a bottom-up tree automaton. The size of the automaton doesn't depend upon the graph because it's this number of states is simply the number of p equivalence classes, where p is the quantifier rank of, uh, of phi. There are things you need which I haven't really said. You need to be able to, first of all, from the tree, compute the tree decomposition. Okay, That I haven't told you at all how to do. That's a difficult algorithmic task in itself, but it turns out you can do it. And here you need also, of course, that you can compute this automaton from phi. Okay. Uh, well, I mean, for the statement as I've given it, you don't, because all I'm saying is there exists an algorithm. I'm not uh, saying that the algorithm can be uh, computed, but in fact, you can. Okay? And you can com get this automaton from uh, this, and then it, it accepts. So from G, compute a label tree T. That's the tree decomposition. From the formula, you compute the automaton, and then you run the automaton on this label tree, and it tells you whether or not the original graph satisfies the formula. Okay? I think this is, uh, I mean, there, there, there's a lot of work that goes into this theorem, and I, I think I've, uh, I was trying to convey some of the flavor of it. Maybe if, uh, it's got a bit technical. So uh, I think maybe this is the point where I'll stop and let you take a breather. OK, questions? Less complexity we know in the parameters k and the, the formula phi is what? So k is single exponential? And yes, uh, phi is non-elementary, non right. So I mean, when I say when phi, so I mean, here you could, yeah, so, so p, the quantifier rank of phi, uh, is non-elementary in p. Right. But in k, it's single exponential. It's in, that's right. So if you fix the formula phi, so the, the only thing that really depends on k is this computation, and that's exponential in k, but linear in g, yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so you have OK. All right. Well, thank you. And uh, we break for lunch. Back at 1.30. Back at 1.30.